Praise the Lord. Welcome today to the Revivalist this evening, I guess it is. And uh, back just continuing doing some teaching here at the Church River of Life and on the broadcast a lot. Uh, dealing with just learning about prayer and effective prayer. Uh, been really digging into the Lord's Prayer quite a bit. And uh, boy, I'm coming away with a lot of different nuggets more than you would anticipate. Um, that's one of the parts of the Bible I think sometimes we hear so much and have heard so much that we've almost turned it into just kind of a traditional thing that we don't really realize that Jesus was laying down some very powerful groundwork about prayer and our prayer life and how to pray. Um, the Lord's Prayer was given as a result of his disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so this is Jesus' key teaching of prayer that he gives to his disciples. And so we have to assume, I think, that this is a great deal of a prayer foundation, actually, of the early church. When uh, Christ was uh, uh, died on the cross, was buried, resurrected, sinned and be on the right hand of the Father, poured out his Holy Spirit, there was a sending out then of the early church, the planning of the church. I'm sure that this foundation of prayer that was laid here was probably the foundation of their prayer life. And so this is probably very key to understanding how the early church operated, how they functioned. Um, today I just want to talk about part of the verse there in uh, verse number 2. And he said unto them, this is Luke chapter 11 by the way, verse number 2, I guess I forgot to say that. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. And so he, those first uh, few words there, hallowed be thy name, I've talked about before, about holiness and sanctification, honoring God's name, thy kingdom come. I did a teaching on that, of praying different ways for the kingdom of God to be manifest. Um, but then it says, thy will be done. And as I said, a lot of times with the Lord's Prayer, people have taken it and turned it into some kind of religious chant or mantra or something. There was an individual I, I used, I, knew, I still know him, I guess, I just haven't seen him for years, a brother in Christ, a good godly man, a precious man, but um, used to be any time he prayed about any situation, whatever it was, how he prayed was he just recited the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, if he's praying for somebody who was sick, he recited the Lord's Prayer. No matter what he was praying, if he's praying for somebody's salvation, he recited the Lord's Prayer. Everything he did, he recited the Lord's Prayer. I'm not knocking that individual in any way, shape, or form, but I assume you understand that's not really what the Lord was referring to. That's not what he meant for us to do, to just recite that over and over and over. And uh, especially this part, thy will be done, I think is really uh, interesting to dig in there. Because a lot of people, again, have turned that into almost like spiritual ignorance is a great thing. They pray about something or not pray about something or whatever situation. They say, oh, God, your will be done. And that's their prayer. God, your will be done. Your will be done. As if that's some kind of super spiritual thing to pray about something without having any knowledge of what God's will is. Without having any knowledge of what God's uh, desires would be in that situation. And, and beloved, that, that's not any way, shape, or form what I believe the Lord is talking about there. I mean, for example, if I'm praying for somebody who's lost without Christ, I don't say God saved them or God, your will be done in their life. I know what God's will is in their life. I know because the Bible tells me that it's not God's will that any should perish. So it's not God's will that that individual perish. So if it's not God's will for them to perish, it's God's will for them to come to a saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. Um, the book of Revelation says, Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And so we see all of those things there that it talks about, obviously there where it's God's will. We know God's will. I know God's will in regards to somebody's salvation. It's God's will for that person to be saved. So obviously I don't have to say, Oh God, whatever your will be done, thy will be done. No, I'm praying very specifically for that person's eyes to be opened up, their ears to be opened up, and for them to see what Jesus Christ has done for them, and for them to see the glory of the Lamb, the glory of Jesus Christ. It's not a mystery what God's will is. You see, the Bible tells us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. 
So obviously, if I'm going to have faith for a situation, I have to have revelation of God's word on that situation. If I have revelation of God's word in a situation, then I know what God's will is in that situation. So unless I have some revelation of his will, how in the world can I ever possibly pray in faith? If I have a situation, I say, well, I don't know what God wants to do here. I'm praying for that situation. The Bible tells me to lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Doesn't that tell you that it's God's will for them to recover? The Bible tells us when we pray for the sick, anointing them with oil, that the prayer of faith shall raise up the sick. Doesn't that tell you there what God's will is for that sick person? The Bible tells us very simply that he's the God who heals us of all of our diseases and forget not all of his benefits. And one of those benefits is the healing of the sick. So I don't have to sit there and think, boy, I don't know, this is just a mystery. I don't know if God wants to heal this person or not heal this person. No, I understand what God's will is. Jesus, by his stripes, by his stripes, that sick person is healed. We understand that, that he took sickness and disease upon him when he was upon the cross. That's very plainly revealed to us in Isaiah chapter 53. So again, why would I have to guess and wonder if it's God's will to heal a sick person? I don't have to guess and wonder that. He's already paid the price for their healing in his death, burial, and resurrection. I know his will. My job then is to believe it and to pray it and to see it come into manifestation. Our job, first and foremost, when we come to prayer, we have to understand something. We don't blindly say, God, thy will be done. I think one of the first matters of prayer is, is to understand and know what God's will is. And if I don't know what God's will, then the first thing I have to do in my prayer life is go to God, go to his word, and find out what is God's will in this situation. What is God's will in this situation? And begin to pray that will to come to pass. Begin to pray that will to see manifestation of that will taking place. That's the reason that we have to expect or anticipate our prayers to be answered. I anticipate my prayers to be answered because I know it's God's will for that prayer to be answered. I anticipate my prayers to be answered because I know it's not only God's will for that prayer to be answered, but I also know that Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection has paid the price for that prayer to be answered. That's simply why we pray in the name of Jesus and not in any other name, because he's paid the price. Let me make another point to you real quick about God's will. I'm going to read a couple of verses to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now notice there in verse 12, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. The Spirit of God comes and lives and dwells within the believer. What is one of the purposes of why him living and dwelling within us? That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So if the Spirit of God lives on the inside of me to reveal to me the things that have been freely given to me of God, and you're out there as a believer, and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you to reveal to you the things that have been freely given to you of God. Beloved, then don't you think that that's going to give us revelation of God's what God's will is in a situation? If he's freely given it to us of us, then obviously it's his will for us to have it. It's not God trying to stop you from receiving the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's the enemy that's trying to put obstacles in your way and to stop you from receiving the things that Christ has paid for. And we need to understand that, that there is a battle sometimes to see the will of God come into manifestation in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in our communities, our churches. Sometimes, obviously not sometimes, all the time. Let me rephrase that. There's a battle in seeing that come into manifestation. That's why the Bible tells us to fight the good fight of faith. And because it is a battle sometimes, or all the time, I don't know why I keep saying sometimes, it's always a battle, trust me, the devil's never sitting back, he does not retire. Um, but let me refer to that too again, in the same passage, same two verses. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So you notice in those two verses, there's two things that jump out at you. The first part, the Spirit of God is on the inside of us to reveal to us things that are freely given to us of God. But it also talks about words of the Holy Spirit. Now, what are words of the Holy Spirit? 
I hold in my hand right here a whole bunch of words that were written by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given us his word right here. He wrote this. The Bible was given by inspiration of God that the Holy Spirit breathed. God breathed into man truth. That's what the word inspired means. It means God's breath or God breathing or out breathed or however you want to phrase that. It's like I always pictured it like when God formed Adam out of the dust and whew, breathed life into him. It's the same way the word of God was birthed as God whew, breathed truth inside of people. The Bible says holy men of old were moved by the Holy Ghost, moved by the Holy Spirit to write down the words that we have of the Holy Spirit. I often chair and probably about every time I teach or preach, somehow or another, it comes into the teaching, the message, the parable that Jesus taught about the two houses. House built upon rock, house built upon sand. House built upon sand is those who hear the word, and when the storms come, they haven't done the word, so the house falls. House built upon rock, those who have heard the word, and the house is built upon rock, and when the storm comes, when the storms come, they've done the word of God, and so that house stands. And beloved, I think more and more as time goes on, that's the most important truth that we as a believer can grasp. And as I watch all the confusing times go on and all the unstable, unstable times, the one thing that I absolutely know that I know that I know that I know, one of the most important things you can do as a believer is to build your life upon the Word of God and upon its solid foundation. And that's as much as any reason why I'm doing what I'm doing sitting here talking to you. That's why we send out this broadcast to help you to build your life upon the Word of God. That's why we send out this message on TV broadcast. We send out the message on Facebook any way we can to get the Word of God to you because I have an understanding and I know that if you build your life upon this Word, then God is going to be able to hold you strong and stable no matter what storms come. And no matter what storms that comes our way tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, if we're standing and willing our life on the Word of God and we're living our life according to the Word of God, we're going to stand strong. And I, I talk about this all the time, beloved. One of the great tragedies, I think, in the body of Christ to some degree is so many people look at this as a history book. As you know, well, in the Old Testament, you know, that's true, that's history. In the New Testament, well, yeah, that was Paul's life, and that's history. And Jesus' life is history, and so on and so forth. But this is, this is a handbook on how to live victoriously. This is how we live in the kingdom of God. This is how we operate and function as God's children. So this is very important that we not only have a Bible in our home, not only that we go to church and hear it preached and hear it taught, but that we actually have the Word of God abiding on the inside of us so we can live our life according to God's Word. And that's so very important. And all we do needs to be built upon this foundation. I tell people that here at the church all the time or in any kind of ministry I do is everything we do needs to be built on the Word of God. Whatever we do in the church, if something is happening in the church that I can't show you in the Word of God and I can't reveal to you that the Word of God says this is how we do it, that I should, that I should stop it from happening. And everything we, that the Word of God says we are to do, I need as a pastor to be doing everything I can to see that come into manifestation. And it don't matter what it is, how we live our lives, how we treat one another, manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what have you. Or if something begins to happen in the, in the services that doesn't line up with the Word of God, then I as a pastor have to hopefully kindly and lovingly quench that and stop it from taking place. And so everything we do has to build upon the foundation. If you're out there and you're a business person, this is the foundation of your business. This is how you build your business. You build it upon the Word of God. And no matter what kind of business storms come, that business will stand. No matter what takes place in, in life, if we're, our foundation is the Word of God, we will stand strong. You know, I was kind of thinking about something um, just recently and. In, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, in uh, verse 11, it talks about the Bereans being more noble than those who were in Thessalonica. And it goes and it gives a reason. And Paul had went into that community, and Paul was ministering and teaching the Word and preaching the kingdom of God. And it says that they, they searched the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. They received the word, let me rephrase that because I just quoted it. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. 
Now, I've talked about that verse a lot, but here just recently I was reading that and something jumped out at me I had never thought about much before. And that's the word they. It says they search the word, word with all, receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily. They did. It wasn't just some individual out here, some lone wolf in the, in the bushes somewhere with a Bible trying to find out whether Paul was right or not. It was a body of believers who were searching the Word of God and examining the Word of God to see what was so and what was true. And I thought, boy, what a nice picture. What a beautiful vision of a body of Christ. What a beautiful vision of the church, of people together working and operating and functioning together, searching the Word of God to see what was so. Why is that so important? Because you know what? I've known a lot of people in life who they kind of run off by themselves and become a lone wolf. And they begin to get all kinds of goofy ideas about the Word of God, about the things of God, because they're by themselves. And when you get isolated, no matter how sincere you are, you're, you're, you're not functioning properly in the kingdom of God. We're never supposed to be isolated. We are a body. And if you're isolated by yourselves, there's all kinds of gifts that are not available to you. Because God puts the gifts in the body of Christ as he wills. So it's important as we exam examine the word of God, examine the scriptures. It's important. We need to be in a body. We need to be in a fellowship that is digging into the word of God as a body, as a unit. There was a time when after the Gentiles had first become to Christ, and there was a lot of uproar within the, the body at that time about, well, they, the Jewish Christians at that time thought, well, they've still got to go by the law of Moses. They have to be circumcised, so on and so forth. And so as that being a lot of turmoil, then there was kind of a, a gathering and, and uh, the elders of the churches and the apostles got together and they began to, to pray and seek God and again, search the scriptures. But it says in Acts chapter 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, to us, to us, to us. So again, there was that body, there was that group coming together, seeking God, examining the scriptures to see what was so. And again, that's so important that we happen to be involved, or they make sure that we're involved in a body of people who are seeking God, in a body of people who are examining the word, a body of people who are looking into truth and and, and sometimes we don't appreciate that. And, and it's been an odd time in, in my life lately. I... The Lord began to speak to me a while back, a month or so ago, and, and just talking to me about that a little bit and showing me how I had had certain people in my life. And, and you know, I look back at it, and some of them have, have passed, and some of them have, you know, went on to be with the Lord, obviously, but that the Lord had put in my life that was there for me to, 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 to tap into and learn from them about the things of God. And wondering did I really honor that and respect that and value that as much as I should have and apparently the Lord's really speaking to my heart some way about it because I've had different dreams about it we're in the dreams I'm talking to people and talking about honoring people respecting people and valuing what we have with brothers and sisters in Christ and realizing that hey I may have a treasure right here Right here in my presence, I may have a treasure in an individual who's, who's, who's more advanced in the things of God I am. Maybe he's more seasoned, he's more mature in the things of God, or she's more seasoned, more mature in the things of God, in the Word of God. And beloved, I encourage you to, if, if God has people in your life, God will have people in your life that are there to impart to you. And make sure you connect with those people. And make sure you allow them to impart to you and make sure that you value that and the importance of that. And uh, I had a dream even last night as I'm sitting here talking, and, and it was the same way. I was, I was sitting around with some other pastors and ministers I know, and we were talking. And in my dream, I began to bring that point up. And I won't mention individuals' names, but I began to mention individuals' names. And I said, you know, I knew that person, and I knew that person. And I said, God put them in my life so that I could, could partake of the things they knew about the things of God. And I says, you know, I look back at my life and I wonder, did I really value that as I should have? You know, I think, would I like to go back and maybe partake a little bit more and ask a few more questions and dig a little deeper into things they knew of God? 
And uh, so that us, that they, and that being in a body where you're seeking God is of the utmost importance. I believe God has a place and a plan for all of us to be involved in a body where we're seeking God. We're seeking God in prayer. We're seeking God in worship. We're seeking God in the Word. And we're seeking God in the truth. It's a they and an us, beloved. And it's very important that we understand that. We have the five-fold ministry that's given as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. But part of that passage is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, wherefore they lie in wait to deceive. So we're given the fivefold ministry to equip us so we're not tossed to and fro. And so if you're being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, and I've known people like that, that, you know, every new thing that comes along, boy, they, they change everything. I, I knew an individual and... Uh, he uh, was called into ministry, and I watched his whole life, and he was tossed by every wind of doctrine. I mean, every new moment, every new thing that came along, that's what he swallowed. And uh, so he was everything you could imagine, and he, uh, you know, was trying to function in the ministry. And one of the last things, one of the people, ministry groups he went to to try to plug in with them and work with them, said, you know, all I see in your life is lack of stability. You've been everything under the sun. And you've been tossed around by every wind of doctrine. You need to get, you need to get stable. You need to get solidified, so to speak, and standing on the word of God. I uh, want to read one more scripture to you, real quick, and that's out of Second Timothy. But sometimes, and I remember years ago, there was kind of a move among us in the body of Christ. And in that move, there was a lot of ideas about, you know, doctrine was a bad word. And uh, we were kind of, you know, supposed to kind of put our Bibles on the shelf and put what we believe on the shelf and just everybody get along then and everything be wonderful then and just, you know, come by God, you know, you know, forget about anything else. And um, that was really kind of popular for a period of time. And uh, I seen the effects of that and I seen some lives really shipwrecked over that. And I would uh, propose to you that there's only one time that the Bible mentions people doing that, that I'm aware of. And that's in the last days, and it's not a good thing. It's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, that's a very serious situation to turn your ears away from truth unto fables. And why am I coming around to all of this? Because remember, we're talking about knowing God's will. And it's important to know God's will. You can't lay down the word of God that gives us revelation of his will without being tossed about with every wind of doctrine. You can't lay down the word of God which reveals his will without falling prey to being like that and coming to a place where you don't endure sound doctrine. You don't endure the word of God and coming to that place where you turn your way to find somebody who's going to teach you itching ears and allow that to... to, to, to promote what you want to believe. If you'll notice something in that verse, let me read that again. There's a key point I want to mention. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers. Remember just a moment ago I talked about how God puts people in our lives that are there to, to mentor us, to disciple us, to impart to us. You notice it doesn't say that it says they shall heap to themselves teachers. You see, if you're running around and you're finding what teacher you want, rather than looking where God wants you. If you're running around thinking, well, I want this church or that church or this church because that really uh, floats my boat, rather than seeking God and saying, God, where do you want me to plug in at? You see, there's a difference there. God has people in there to, to, to raise you up and to disciple you and to teach you and to impart to you. But you have to seek God and be connected and plugged into that. It's not something that you choose because you like the way that building looks or you choose because you like the band or you choose because the, the pastor wears a bow tie or don't wear a bow tie. But it's something we need to be very serious about, about where we plug in in the things of God. And see, we're talking about thy will be done. See, God's will is you're plugged in someplace to people who can season you and raise you up in the things of God. 
your will may be different. You may just want the latest fads. You may just want the best entertainment. But God has a will. Thy will be done. That's a very important place to come in life. You see, because to truly pray for God's will to be done, I have to be consecrated to God's will to be done. If I really don't want God's will to be done in my life, I'm not going to pray for God's will to be done in my life. I might say those words. But if the desire of my heart is not to see the will of the Father manifest in my life, then I don't think those, those prayers, those words amount to anything. I can say, oh God, your will be done in my life, but absolutely, totally closed off to what his will is. Now, that's not a sincere prayer. That's just speaking words. The Bible speaks about a people who serve him with their lips, but their heart is far from him. And if we're going to God and saying, God, your will be done, and God's will is that you go down here and, you're, and you plug into this church and you hear this person or that man or that woman teach you the word of God and raise you up in the things of God, but you absolutely know that your will is to completely go the opposite direction. That, that prayer doesn't amount to a hill of beans. You see, God has a will for your life. And he has a place that he wants you to come and, and surrender. You know, we, we see the example in Jesus. Father, if thou be willing, before he was prepared to go upon the cross, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, that wasn't a prayer of ignorance. Jesus wasn't saying, I don't know what God's will is. He obviously knew that. He already taught everybody he was a good shepherd. He was going to give his life for the sheep. He already taught the disciples on numerous occasions that he was going to die and be buried and resurrected. He knew all of that. That was a prayer of surrender, a prayer of consecration. And one of the first things we're going to learn is in prayer here is our life and our heart has to be consecrated to the Lord for our prayers to be effective. If the desire of your heart is not for God's will to be done in your life, then you're not going to have an effective prayer life. It's that simple. But I'm going to leave you today with that thought and just encourage you to Dig into God's Word and build your life upon God's Word. And truly, if there's areas in your life where you're battling and struggling like that, get alone with God and say, God, what is your will? What is your will for me? What is your will for my life right now? What is your will? How do I serve you? Where do I go get equipped, Lord God? Where do, I, where do you want me to be discipled, Lord? What do I need to do, Lord? So you can come to that place in your heart where you can truly be like Jesus. Say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. If, uh, and I just encourage you with that tonight and um, to go to that place and fight that altar, so to speak, and lay down your, your will and say, God, your will. And we'll close right there with that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah.